I'm Laura Lucas Magnuson, and this is The World Unpacked. It started with one man in one country, Tunisia, who set himself on fire when the police confiscated his fruit cart, leaving him with no way to make money. Mouazizi died January 4th. Word went out on Facebook to take to the streets. The message was received. On January 14th, tens of thousands brought the nation's capital, Tunis, to a halt. Now the world started paying attention. That set off a movement that kicked out longtime president Zen al Abidin Ben Ali. A region was gripped with freedom fever. Tunisia is heading to the polls on Sunday to vote for a new president just one month after electing its parliament. The country which kick-started the Arab Spring is completing its transition to democracy four years on from the revolution with its first free presidential elections. Mohamed Bouazizi died on January 4, 2011. And his name remains a symbol of the aspirations of a young nation in quest of social justice and a future. On December 17, 2010, a Tunisian street vendor named Mohamed Bouzizi set himself on fire to protest corruption and poor economic conditions. His death sparked mass popular protests in Tunisia that quickly carried over to other countries in the Middle East. Today, we're talking to Sarah Yerkes, a senior fellow in Carnegie's Middle East program, about how Tunisia has changed in the 10 years since the Arab Spring. Sarah has spent much of the past decade, both in government and at Carnegie, trying to understand this period and tracking Tunisia's transition. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So Tunisia is often hailed as the success story in the Arab Spring. The protests that shook the country led to the ousting of longtime President Ben Ali and resulted in democratic elections. What is your assessment of how Tunisia has been able to sustain its democracy, even as other countries with similar promise have not? I think there's two main reasons that Tunisia has been successful. First of all is the consensus model that Tunisia adopted early on. The major political factions, even those that were really at odds with each other, decided that democracy was more important to them than their own political success. And so you had the two main actors, the Anahda or the Islamist party, and the former president, Beji Sebsi, who was kind of a grandfather of Tunisia. They came together. They were really political rivals, and they decided that they were going to make this democracy happen. And it didn't matter that their own parties were maybe not going to succeed right away. And the second reason that Tunisia succeeded was the civil society that was there. They have this vibrant, active civil society that has held politicians accountable over the past decade. The participation of civil society, whether it's in the street, in protests, or in consultation to the government, which has really become formalized in the constitution as well as normalized as part of regular political activity, has made sure that government is held accountable. And they haven't always succeeded, but the government knows that civil society is there watching them and reporting to the public what is going on. And this keeps them honest in a way that we just frankly don't see elsewhere in the region. Now, Tunisia has gone through three different prime ministers in 2020. Is this just emblematic of a still young democracy working out how to govern? Or are there other concerns that you see on the horizon? And and can it stabilize as we go into 2021? So what we've seen in 2020 is due to this incredibly fractured nature of parliament that was elected at the end of 2019. The largest party in parliament, the Islamist party in Nahda, has less than 25 percent of seats. So they've ended up having to have very precarious coalitions in order to govern. But this is a bigger problem, not just from 2020. Tunisia's had actually 13 governments in 10 years. And this is due in part to the fact, as you mentioned, that the parties just aren't mature. This is a very young democracy. 10 years is not a long time. Um, Many of the parties are not even 10 years old. They're maybe one or two years old. And so as a result, many of the parties are actually kind of personality driven. They're not really issue driven. So we tend to see members of parliament jumping from party to party within a single electoral cycle, which means people have very little loyalty to any sort of particular party. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of polarization, and this has gotten a lot worse and was really sort of at its peak at the end of 2020, when in December, two different members of different political parties got into an actual physical fight on the floor of parliament, leaving one with a bloodied face. This is kind of this culmination of what polarization looks like. So this idea that political figures are kind of 
willing to give up really easily when governing gets hard. You know, they they don't really have a lot of loyalty to a particular cause or particular issue. So they tend to jump ship and call for a new government without realizing that there is a cost to change governments. And this cost has actually become quite high over the years. And are there elections on the horizon uh, in 2021? Not as of right now. Um, the the government is holding, although there's been rumors pretty much since day one of this current government that it will likely fold at some point. The prior government only lasted for five months. This one so far is on track. But again, at, at any point, we could hear calls for this. And we do from time to time hear calls for this government to fall as well. So we'll see what happens as we get further into 2021. Tunisia also has seen social progress and some major gains for women more women in parliament, a female mayor of Tunis, and the formal outlawing of domestic violence against women. What was their role in the revolution? And are there things that women in Tunisia are still fighting for? So even prior to the revolution, women in Tunisia benefited from a lot more equality than anywhere else in the region. Tunisia has always kind of held up this pride as being the most advanced when it comes to gender equality throughout the Middle East and North Africa. So during the revolution, women were able to be in the streets like men. They took part in the transition alongside men, participating in the earliest transitional government, helping to write the constitution. But there's still not full equality. And I sort of compare Tunisia to what we see a lot of times in the West, where rights on paper are there. But in practice, a lot of the sort of gender equality that you expect just hasn't been realized. And one example of this is in 2017, they passed a really amazing gender-based violence law that really was remarkable in the region, but also globally. Um, But this law, you know, even though it's now more than three years old, hasn't really been put into place in practice. You know, women still don't understand their rights, particularly in some of the more marginalized areas in the rural areas in the interior. No one has really gone out and explained to women what happens if you're suffering from abuse. Um, And worse than that, though, the judicial system hasn't really been trained on what to do about this. So if a woman brings forward a case, if she goes to report some sort of case of gender-based violence, Often the judicial system, the police don't know what to do about that. And so this is something that, again, it's, you know, it's great on paper, but that's only worked so far until you implement it. Uh, another issue where women continue to fight for their rights is that is kind of in the social sphere. There's still a lot of very conservative communities in Tunisia where women are just not given the same opportunities as men. Um, and I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago when I was doing some research in Tunisia, I met a young woman in a region called Siliana, which is in the interior. And this was during the local elections. And she wanted to run for local office. She's the head of an NGO. She's incredibly independent, you know, lived her own life. She was doing all sorts of things all on her own. But that was a line, that was a red line for her family. And her brother actually told her he would not allow her to run for local office. So it just kind of shows you that, you know, society's not quite there. There are still taboos around certain issues that in certain parts of the country, you know, it's, it is really hard for women to actually achieve full equality. We'll be right back to talk about some of the unfinished pieces of Tunisia's revolution. Sarah, despite some significant successes, Tunisia's revolution is often described as incomplete. Many of the economic and social conditions that led to the protest movement have either been addressed superficially or not at all. Let's first start talking about the economy. Which economic issues have persisted over the last decade and have any dissipated completely or just simply taken on new forms? So I think this is a really important point that the issues that led to the revolution were not political issues. This was not initially a revolution about democracy. This was a revolution about economic injustice. So when you look at, you know, has the revolution succeeded? Where is the economy today? The story is not very good, unfortunately. Um, you know, Mohamed Bouazizi, whose self-immolation eventually resonated with people across the Arab world, he was there taking a stand against a couple of really important things that unfortunately still persist. One was corruption. Second was the kind of injustice of living in this area that the Tunisian government had intentionally held back for decades. There's a lot of regions of the country away from the coast, in the interior and in the south, that had specifically been held back by um, the Bourguiba government, who was the first government after independence, and then perpetuated under the Ben Ali government. And also, you know, Mohamed Bouazizi was there protesting the inability to make the ends meet while he's sitting in his town watching the elites in Tunis growing wealthier by the day. So unfortunately, you know, a decade later, much of that has not improved. 
corruption is still there, although it's taken on a very different form. There's kind of this, what some have referred to as the democratization of corruption, where instead of kind of the grand sort of mafia-esque type of corruption that was famous under Ben Ali, there's now much more petty corruption. You still have the regional marginalization that inspired Bouazizi. Um, the government has tried to address some of this through its decentralization plans. They have written into the constitution the phenomenon of positive discrimination, where they have said they will set aside more resources for the traditionally marginalized areas, but a lot of that just hasn't actually come to fruition. Um, and we've also seen, unfortunately, from the COVID-19 pandemic, challenges that have been exposed in these regions where, for example, the number of ICU beds pales dramatically. There are more than half of the regions in Tunisia did not have a single ICU bed at the start of COVID. So this idea that, you know, the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots, which really drove Bouazizi in the first place, and drove the revolution to start, those things are still there. And that's something that's very worrying as we look forward at what the next decade is going to bring. And what measures do you think would provide the economic reform needed for growth and success, or maybe even just executing on those things, as you said, are, are there on paper, but maybe haven't permeated throughout society? Yeah, so I think that, you know, when the Tunisian early transitional governments set out to kind of fix things or undo all the the sort of the issues under Ben Ali, they put things into the constitution that are that are really great, including this positive discrimination aspect, um, but they haven't been realized. And so one thing is to actually, you know, implement the measures in the constitution. They started a decentralization process in 2018, but that's really been quite stilted. Um, so they have kind of three levels of government, local government, and then regional or kind of state government, and then national government. And the local government is now elected. They had their first ever democratic local elections in 2018. And that really helped to bring government closer to the people and help address some of this, these issues of, of services, of infrastructure, of things not being provided to people in some of the marginalized areas. But this middle level of government, the regional or state government, that is still appointed centrally by the central state. And I think until that is removed, until they have elections for that level of government, you, you end up with this weird kind of hybrid phenomenon where the, the central state still has their hand in local affairs. And again, that's one of the things that kind of made things problematic back in 2010. Um, so that's one thing, in, you know, investing in the interior in the South, making this positive discrimination a reality. But the second thing is removing some of the bureaucratic hurdles to economic growth. Tunisia has one of the highest public sector wage bills in the world. And this has been an issue throughout the past decade where they've sought ways to shift jobs out of the public sector to the private sector to help lessen the burden on the state. But they come up against an incredibly powerful labor union, the UGTT, the, the general labor union, who's pushed back on any attempt at shrinking the public sector. And that's really hurt the economy. Tunisia needs to figure out how they can both protect the public sector workers, but also try to increase private sector investment, help to diversify the economy so that you're not just counting on the state providing income for such a large percentage of the public. Let's go back to corruption. Um, as you said, corruption is been and remains a key grievance for many Tunisians who participated in the protests and today. How have anti-corruption measures played out over the last 10 years? So anti-corruption was one of the top priorities from day one of the revolution. This is something that, again, was very clear that this is part of what Bouazizi is protesting against. This is an issue that resonated with so many Tunisians. So they started an anti-corruption commission immediately after Ben Ali was removed. Um, and that had a couple of different tasks. One was kind of going after some of the big wigs, some of the mafia type figures, and also recovering the stolen assets. There's estimated to, to be, you know, tens of billions of dollars of assets assets that the Ben Ali family and regime stole from the Tunisian people. So this is something that has been a priority, kind of that top level corruption. Um, and another thing that they've done to try to get at some of this was this really innovative measure, which was including economic crimes within the transitional justice process, along with physical crimes like torture. So in most countries, when you go through a transitional justice process, you're looking at the physical aspect of things. I think Tunisia is the first country to ever include economic crimes in their, in their reconciliation process. So that's really important. But while most of these measures kind of get at the head of the snake, they haven't really gotten at the lower level. So corruption does persist. As I mentioned before, it's this democratization of corruption where now anyone can benefit corruption. You know, before, all corruption kind of flowed up to Ben Ali and his family. 
now, you know, the doctor taking the bribe, he can pocket that bribe. He doesn't have to give his share to the person above him and the person above him. Um, so unfortunately, this is, while corruption overall has been a priority, it's been really, really difficult to get at this kind of lower level of corruption. And talking about um, including economic justice, as you said, in the transitional movement, how did that play out? Can you give us a little more texture about what was intended and, and what the effect was? Sure. So there's a couple of aspects to it. I mean, one is kind of the individual cases. And another part of it that was really innovative was including victim regions within the transitional justice process. Several of these victim regions did, in fact, end up um, submitting claims into the transitional justice process. And there have been varying outcomes. Part of the challenge is how do you determine uh, fault at this? And then how do you, what kind of retribution is there for this? So it's been a really interesting phenomenon to see. I don't think Tunisia necessarily did a perfect job, but the fact that they've even acknowledged this sort of discrimination against full regions has been really remarkable and has at least given the people of these regions some sort of, you know, symbolic retribution, the acknowledgement that their government actually was part of this system at keeping them down, I think has helped tremendously in moving forward. And and as you said, moving forward, looking forward, what specifically do you think should be done to more effectively tackle some of the corruption problems that you're we're still seeing in the country? So I think, unfortunately, one of the most challenging things that needs to be done, but does need to be done, is kind of changing the culture around corruption. You know, some Tunisians who I've spoken with have said, you know, if they were in a different country, they would never pay a bribe to like go see a doctor or to help their kid get into a high school. But in Tunis, they just do it without thinking because there's no other way around it. Um, and I think this is something that takes decades not just one decade, it takes many decades to change, is how do you make it so that it's not socially acceptable to be on either side of corruption, to be on the asking or the giving side? Um, and I don't, honestly don't know how you do that without just time and without sort of making some sort of public information campaigns around this. But I think it, it's something that people are working on. They're trying to make it so that this isn't part of the system, but it still is. You know, pretty much every sort of cog in the system, whether it's taxi drivers, police, it's doctors, it's schools, everyone engages in some form of petty corruption. And so figuring out how do you make it so this is just not something that's okay anymore, the way it isn't in a lot of other places. Um, and the second thing is addressing the informal economy. So the informal economy makes up about half, 50% of Tunisia's GDP. So the informal economy, so figuring out how to incorporate people into the formal economy, both in a way that protects them so that they are able to receive social services, social security, but also so that captures the informal economy in a way that's beneficial to the state. You know, when people are in the informal economy, they're not paying taxes, they're not contributing to the state in the same way. And this was one of the things also that drove Bouazizi in the first place. You know, he was part of the informal economy. So figuring out how do you make this a, the system that's beneficial to the informal workers and also to the state at the same time that helps get at some of the issues tied to corruption. And another challenge, obviously, has been uh, the coronavirus pandemic and the Tunisian government, like many around the world, you know, is still trying to navigate that. How has the pandemic itself impacted political, economic and social progress in Tunisia? So the pandemic has really had a negative impact on Tunisia, like many places around the world. Um, I was in Tunis in February of 2020, just days before Tunisia had its first case of the coronavirus. And what I saw then in February 2020 was the most optimistic environment I had seen in a while. You know, the economy was on a positive trajectory for the first time in years. They were expecting great tourism numbers in the summer of 2020, and a new prime minister and government had just taken office. So there was really this sense of hope, and then COVID hit. And COVID really took all that progress and just destroyed it. You know, today, the economy is in shambles. The tourism sector has basically been decimated, although hopefully eventually it will return at some point. And around a third of the kind of small and medium enterprises are expected to not survive past the pandemic. So what you're seeing is, you know, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger um, in the political scene, increasing polarization, as I mentioned before, and skyrocketing levels of mistrust with the government. And unfortunately, the people who are suffering the most from the pandemic are the same people who sparked the revolution in the first place, the people in the interior and the South. You know, we've also started to see in the end of 2020 waves of protests and just this kind of general sense of anger and frustration that's boiling over. 
Um, you know, not I don't expect we're going to see another revolution in 2021, but you are seeing a lot of the same things surface that we saw in 2010. We'll be back in a moment to look at how Tunisia's revolution has impacted the trajectory of the region over the past decade. Sarah, as we talked about, Tunisia's revolution took place in tandem with many other popular protests at the time. What factors allowed Tunisia to be successful while others, Egypt or Syria, have failed? There were a few factors that Tunisia benefited from. First is that they were first. So they had the element of surprise. You know, the Tunisian government, the Ben Ali government, did not expect the revolution to succeed. By the time the Arab Spring got to Egypt, Mubarak sort of saw the writing on the wall and he was able to respond in a different way. You know, in Tunisia, you had this idea that these are just protests. They've had protests before. They'll have them again. It's fine. Um, So they were, the protesters, you know, were able to kind of take this on in a pretty quick way without the authorities being prepared for it. The second thing is that Ben Ali left peacefully. And I think this is really important. You know, he decided he went to exile. He lived out the remainder of his life in Saudi Arabia and of pretty good life. And this avoided the kind of protracted conflict that we've seen elsewhere in like Syria, Libya, Yemen. This was really important both for the transitional justice process that you had this person who was gone and you could actually have this kind of move along, this process move along, but also you didn't have the kind of massive clashes that you had in other places because Ben Ali left of his own accord in a way. And the third reason um, was the role of the military. So the Tunisian military has not traditionally played a political role. Uh, While the police themselves were known for repression and torture, the army had been a neutral actor and was really, you know, stayed that way throughout the protests. So the protesters also, I think, were a little more confident than they were in other places that they were going to be safe, that the army was not going to fire on them or not going to kind of take the regime aside. They didn't know that for sure. And there were some clashes, but in general, they were a little safer than they were in other places. And Tunisia has managed, as you said, to avoid state-sponsored violence and repression, unlike some of these other countries. What factors further do you think have allowed Tunisia to continue on this remarkably peaceful path? So I think, you know, initially it goes back to the role of the military, who, again, you know, didn't turn on the protesters in the same way that they did in Egypt or elsewhere, and actually turned on the regime in a way. But after that, you know, after the initial revolution, there were some moments, there were definitely moments of violence related to violent extremists from terrorist groups, including ISIS, but not from the Tunisian state. And I think this goes back to the point I made at the beginning about consensus. So even during the darkest days of the transition in 2013, you saw, you know, the rise of Islamist extremists, you saw two assassinations of leftist politicians, but the country came together and they put the transition back on track. They followed this consensus model that had worked for them in the beginning. And this is where you had this group called the Quartet that was the heads of four of the kind of most prominent civil society organizations came together, figured out a plan. These were four groups that weren't necessarily always on the same page, but figured out how to make things work and get the country to stay along the path of democratic transition. And they actually eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. But at the same time, Anahda, the Islamist party, who was in power at the time, stepped down. You know, they took the path of saying, we're going to have this country move forward. We're going to have democracy move forward. It's okay. We're going to step back. Clearly, we're not doing a great job right now. It's time for someone else to take the reins. And we didn't see this happen elsewhere. You know, this, I think, was a very selfless act by them. And I think that really helped them, helped avoid bigger clashes. And again, you know, I think through to today, pretty much, not everyone, but pretty much all the political actors are committed to democracy. They might not agree on what that democracy looks like, but they want the democratic transition to succeed. And that continues to keep Tunisia moving forward. Let's talk about the regional dynamics here. How has Tunisia's transition impacted the country's relations with other regional actors? So Tunisia has been a beacon of hope to activists around the MENA region. You know, Tunisians are actually very careful to say that they're not a model to be emulated. They don't want to be seen as something that you kind of copy and paste the Tunisian revolution onto another context. And that might be true. But I think it's really important for other actors in the region, particularly for civil society activists, pro-democracy activists that are watching Tunisia and hoping that they can follow on a similar path. And I'll give an example um, of Algeria. You know, the Algerian protests that took place throughout 2019, throughout 2020, 
and continue the transition kind of continues there. While you can't say that the protests are necessarily directly tied to the Tunisian revolution, I do think it's likely that Tunisia's success gave confidence to the Algerian protesters that they could unseat Bouteflika, their longtime leader. I think if we hadn't seen a success, if we hadn't seen a democracy in North Africa, a democracy next door to Algeria, it might not have been as likely that we would see those protesters in the street. So I think the big thing that Tunisia, the big impact Tunisia has had on the region as being this beacon of hope. And it's also an important safe haven for other activists, particularly those from Egypt and Libya, people who are not really able to meet and have you know free discussion at home. They can come to Tunis for conferences or even set up in exile. You have a lot of kind of civil society activists in exile in Tunisia. And that's been one really important thing. Uh, the flip side of that is that Tunisia has also been kind of a target for some of the anti-democratic forces. So you've had some incidents of violent extremism that I mentioned. You know, there's an ISIS cell that's set up in Libya that Tunisians have gone from Tunisia, trained in Libya and come back and carried out some attacks in Tunisia. Um, and you've also seen some of the regional actors, some of the Gulf actors in particular, who aren't so keen to see a democracy in the region, who've kind of funneled some money in to try to prevent that, but they haven't really been very successful. Tunisia generally has a neutral foreign policy, and they've been pretty good at maintaining that. And so in general, you know, Tunisia kind of sits there as this beacon and kind of attracts some good and some bad attention, but has managed to navigate that quite well. So building on this idea um, of Tunisia as sort of an example and model, more broadly, what lessons do you think that its success can offer other countries, not just in the region, uh, but around the world? I think the biggest lesson Tunisia has to offer is that consensus has to last beyond the square. You know, for a revolution to succeed, you actually have to have a lot of disparate groups come together. People need to unite in the public square to overthrow their leader. But often what happens is after you leave, after you go home, once you succeed in removing the leader, that unity quickly dissolves to infighting and to failure. And we saw this in the case of Egypt, for example. But the lesson of Tunisia, I think, is that you need to put the transition first. You know, the, the movement that came together, the whatever it was, pro-democracy, anti-corruption, whoever, whatever it was that sparked your unity to come together in the square, you need to keep that momentum going, even if your own political gain is, is going to be secondary. And I think that that's something Tunisia has been really successful at and could be learned by other places. You know, play the long game, realize that, you know, if you stay together, if you stay united as a pro-democracy movement, in the end, you will have your chance. You know, every group will kind of get its chance to succeed later on. But I think another, the kind of the more important lesson, which is something that really persists today, that Tunisia taught a lot of people in the region is that people have power. You know, even in the most hopeless situations, people can make change. And I think, you know, if we look back at Mohamed Bouazizi, I mean, he had no idea that the anger he felt, the frustration, the hopelessness and despair that he felt would actually unseat this incredibly powerful dictator who had stolen billions of dollars from the Tunisian people. Mohamed Bouazizi was angry. He was upset. He couldn't take it anymore. And he did what he felt was necessary for his own situation. But in doing so, he set off events that are still unfolding a decade later and will continue to unfold for decades to come. And I think, you know, when you look at the Tunisian revolutionaries that continue to take to the streets to make sure their transition is not forgotten, you know, these are civil society activists who give all of their time and energy to protect democratic gains. They have proven that people can make a difference. I mean, these are just regular people. And, you know, authoritarians, I think, thrive and succeed by convincing people that they're powerless, that they have no recourse. And Tunisia showed that that's not the case. And so I think that that's something that a lot of people, not just in the Middle East, but around the world can look at and say, people do have power, that they can stand up and they can actually make a change. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The World Unpacked, produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're grateful for your listen and eager for your feedback. We welcome your emails at podcasts at ceip.org. And please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Laura Lucas Magnuson, on Twitter, at Laura L. Magnuson. These discussions are only made possible by our wonderful team behind the pod. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producer is Maya Krishna Rogers. We'll see you next time.